After a fair amount of requests from a whole bunch of my subscribers, I finally checked out the show Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. I'm into season two now and still really enjoying it. And the first thing that came to me for these characters that I really liked the idea of was rewriting them and redesigning them into another superhero universe, as I've done with many other franchises on this channel. But this time I'm just gonna put characters into different elements of the DC universe. Because Marvel gets more than its fair share of play on this channel, and honestly just all of my best ideas were DC related this time. So let's see how this goes, shall we? Let's go! Hit like, if you want, subscribe, if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. Like many people who find themselves in the lifestyle, Marinette Dupin-Cheng had never intended to become a superhero. She had wanted to become a fashion designer, and in her last year of high school, she was ready to head off to Paris to attend a prestigious design university. But after accidentally coming across an experimental piece of technology, her path would veer off in a very different direction. It all started with a massive crush that Marinette had on a boy at Rio Grande High School named Jaime Reyes. She'd had a crush on him basically since the day she'd met him, but was always pretty awkward around him, barely able to carry a conversation. One day, a nosy friend of hers was trying to convince her to call him and to ask him to go to a movie with her. She finally worked up the nerve, called, left a bit of a manic but still clear message, then thought she'd hung up. Thinking she had, she started talking to her friend about how amazing she thought Jaime was, and saying all manner of gushingly honest things about him, only to soon after realize she hadn't actually hung up the phone. When she finally noticed that all that had gone through his voicemail, she was mortified. She needed to get his phone and delete the message before he heard it. Luckily, their school made all students leave their phones in their lockers when they went off to class. Jaime had a class during Marinette's lunch, so she just had to go and break into his locker to get the phone. When she got to the hall where Jaime's locker was, though, she saw him rushing up to it in a bit of a panic. Odd, since he should have been in class. He shoved some box into his locker, then shut it and ran off. When she was sure he was gone, Marinette snuck up to the locker and tried a few different combinations that she thought Jaime might use. His birthday, his late father's birthday. Eventually, she got it and found the phone. She deleted the message she'd left and shoved the phone back in, but as she pulled her arm out, she bumped the box that Jaime had just put inside, and it dropped onto the hallway floor, opening and revealing two small red beetle-like objects. She quickly grabbed them both, intending to shove them back in the box in the locker, but as soon as she touched them, they came to life. They crawled across her body and up behind her ears, then sticking right into her head. She tried to pull them off, but couldn't, and seconds later the bell rang. The halls were about to flood with students, so she shoved the empty box back in and slammed the locker shut, then ran away. She ran out around the back of the school trying to get the bug things off her, but it was still no use. It was like they'd burrowed into her skin. And while trying to yank them away, a voice spoke into her mind. Welcome, Red Ladybug user. I am your interface companion, Tiki. The voice scared her, but Marinette quickly asked what this thing was. Tiki explained that it was a biomechanical creation suit, able to grant its wielder with incredible abilities. Then Tiki promptly stated that rather than tell Marinette what she could now do with this technology, it would show her. Spawning from the two little bugs, a fluid armored suit overtook her body, giving her a look that she quickly recognized as resembling that of her city's local superhero, the Blue Beetle. The suit stated that its flight capabilities had not yet been fully brought online, but proceeded with a different demonstration of how she could move. The suit overtook her movements and flung from her forearms what looked like red yo-yos. They stuck to the top of the school, yanked her up, and Marinette was sent flying into the air. She landed on the roof after a fall that should have broken her legs, but she was totally fine. In fact, better than fine. She ran across the roof with incredible speed then leapt off it, sprouting wings to glide nearly half a mile before landing on a street, with cars having to weave around her. She told the suit to stop, but Tiki said that the demonstration was not yet over. It showed off even more in a far too flashy display, flinging her right into and through the streets of Palmyra City nearby. She was given a show of how she could move and that her suit could create all manner of weapons over her arms and create various helpful objects for her to use. But of course this display had drawn a lot of attention, and soon Marinette was faced with the hero that she so clearly resembled. Blue Beetle appeared on the scene demanding how she'd gotten the Ladybug tech. With Tiki influencing what she said, encouraging her to keep her identity secret, she said that the earpieces had come to her and found her and chosen her. Blue Beetle claimed that he gave the tech to a friend of his for safekeeping. 
concerned that she may be someone from his school and wanting to keep his own secret identity safe, as Jaime Reyes, the very boy that Marinette had a crush on. He told her that what she wore was an experimental piece of weapons technology made by Cord Industries, developed prior to its former CEO being fired. They'd made many experiments trying to replicate his own Blue Beetle abilities, and Project Ladybug had been the most successful. He then tried to convince her that they needed to find a way to get the Ladybug tech off her, but while well, he did, they were both attacked by a mechanical gorilla. This was a foe Jaime had tussled with before, Silverback, and the villain had been trying to find and steal all of Cord's old projects like the Ladybug. Without much other choice, Marinette and Blue Beetle teamed up to take down the villain, and in the process, Blue Beetle was mesmerized by Ladybug's movements and abilities. She was unnatural, even getting into surprisingly witty banter with the villain as they fought. By the time the dust was settling, Marinette had done much of the work in taking down the foe, and Blue Beetle had his own massive crush building on his new ally. All the while, Marinette was realizing how exhilarating it was being a superhero and using this tech, and she decided that regardless of whether she could or not, she didn't really want to give it up. He agreed to let her keep the suit for now, but neither of them were willing to reveal their identities. So, for the time being, they became like partners in their superhero lives, having no idea that, with Marinette crushing on Jaime and Blue Beetle crushing on Ladybug, they both desperately wanted a romance to spark between them. If only they knew one another's secret identities. By the time he'd figured out what exactly his father did, Adrian Falcone felt foolish for not having known sooner. Carmine Falcone ran one of the biggest crime families in all of Gotham City, and as a result, he was incredibly wealthy. Adrian had no interest in a life of crime himself. In fact, unbeknownst to his father, he'd been going out at night fighting low-end crime as a vigilante, calling himself Cat Noir. Pulling influence for his suit from various members of the Bat family of Gotham and from Catwoman, who he had no affiliations with, but he was a big fan of her attire and quite fond of cats himself. Of course, for a while, he was not one of the more successful vigilantes in Gotham. Even in the neighborhood of Gotham he'd frequent most, as he attended college there, Burnside, he still wasn't the most skilled vigilante around. That accolade went to his superhero crush, Batgirl. Adrian could have had an upper hand in his fights due to his fencing skills, but he hadn't wanted to use a sword as a vigilante because he didn't want to kill or maim anyone. This meant he was limited in what he could do for some time. That is, until he was given an upgrade by an unexpected source. Nearing the end of a night of trying to thwart some of his own father's lackeys, Adrian was approached by a tall, regal figure in assassin's garb. The man called himself Ra's al Ghul, and he said that members of his League of Assassins had been watching Adrian and wanted to give him an edge in his work. You see, Ra's was obsessed with creating balance in the world, and while he'd attempted on multiple occasions to wipe out large swaths of the Gotham populace, seeing it as essentially a place that was a lost cause too full of chaos to be saved, he'd been thwarted on every attempt by Batman and his allies. So, now he was trying a new approach. He'd give resources to some of the heroes of the city, and see if there was any chance they truly could bring enough light to this place to balance out its dark underbelly. Of course, the Bat family was too skeptical of Roz to accept any help from him, but Adrian was willing to take whatever help he could get. Roz gave him an item that he'd had crafted called the Lazarus Ring. It was made with waters from the Lazarus Pit infused into it, a mystical pool that Roz had access to that practically made him immortal. The ring could restore and heal the wearer's injuries, also enhancing their speed, strength, and agility. But when activated with an enchanted phrase, which essentially translated from Arabic into cataclysm, the ring could have more destructive effects on non-biological materials. It would create a black energy around the wearer's hand, and they could then use it to land a strike that would cause massive destruction. Rawls also warned, however, that Adrian could only wear the ring for an hour or so at a time. Being an item forged with Lazarus energy, it had the risk of driving him mad if he wore it for too long. Adrian accepted the ring, and Roz said that the League of Assassins would have their eyes on him. From there, Adrian's vigilante career took off. The powers he gained from the ring made him able to take on far more dangerous threats, even going up against the likes of Killer Croc and Clayface with a fair degree of success. 
He even finally caught the attention of Batgirl, who was impressed with his skills and appreciated his help, but frequently ignored his flirtatious attitude towards her. When he'd learned about his father's criminal life and actions, he was unsure of how to handle it and wasn't ready yet to share any information about the Falcons with Batgirl. Little did he know, though, that in his alternate life as Adrian, a student at Burnside College, Batgirl was already doing all she could to get information out of him about his father. You see, while Batgirl didn't know that Cat Noir had any connections to Falcone, she did know that Adrian, her fellow student during her day life as Barbara Gordon, did. And while she tried to ignore the fact that she also had strong romantic feelings towards Adrian Falcone, she did all she could to get close to him and learn anything that would help her take down Carmine Falcone and his whole criminal empire. And while a day would inevitably have to come when all the cards would be put on the table and Adrian and Barbara would have to agree on what to do about his father, for the time being they'd work together to keep Gotham and Burnside safe from various threats as the miraculous Batgirl and Cat Noir. Alia Cesare had an insatiable desire for information on Portland's resident hero and one of Earth's current Green Lanterns. She even ran a fan site dedicated to the hero called The Lantern Logs. She spent much of her time raving to her closest friend, Jessica Cruz, about the latest info and updates on the Green Lantern's actions, having no idea that Jessica Cruz was the very hero she was raving about. You see, while Earth had had many Green Lanterns in the past, Jessica Cruz was one of the current ones. She'd once possessed a ring from another dimension called the Ring of Voltum, a twisted version of a Green Lantern ring that came to her because of great anxiety she'd used to experience. But she'd managed to use it for good for some time, even joining the Justice League. Eventually, in an effort to save the Flash's life, she'd nearly been killed and the ring was destroyed, but for her bravery in the face of great fear, she'd been granted a proper Green Lantern ring afterwards. Much of this, besides the more personal information such as her identity, were things you could read about on Alia's Lantern Logs. Currently partnered with fellow Lantern of Earth, Simon Boz, she protected her home city, the world, and even nearby planets from whatever threats came their way which would eventually lead to Alia getting a ring of her own, though not of the same color as Jessica. You see, the wielder of the orange ring of avarice and greed, Larflees, came to Earth seeking more items to hoard on the planet he resided on, Okara. He'd only ever leave that planet to acquire more and more items to try and sate his greed, but coming to Earth quickly put him on the radar of Jessica and Simon, and of course soon after, Alia. As a very public conflict occurred between the different colored lanterns, Alia voraciously devoured every piece of information from every news source that was covering it. She desperately wanted to be near the action herself, but the fight didn't occur anywhere near Portland. By the time the conflict had completed, Jessica and Simon had managed to incapacitate Larflees, and astoundingly finally taken the orange lantern ring from him. Simon would then take Larflees to a metahuman prison until they could arrange transport back to the Green Lantern home planet of Oa for the Guardians of the Universe to decide what to do with him, and Jessica kept the Orange Lantern Ring with her, not trusting it with anyone else. She returned home and kept it in her pocket, even when she went to spend time with Alia at her apartment. As she was one to do, Alia regaled Jessica with information about what had happened with the Lanterns and spoke of how desperately she wanted more information and more access to the heroes to learn more about them. As she expressed her desire for more and more and more, the ring in Jessica's pocket couldn't resist her. Before Jessica had a chance to stop it, the orange ring of greed flew out of Jessica's pocket and right on to Alia's finger. It transformed her into an orange lantern, and Alia was confused but also ecstatic. Of course, that meant Jessica's secret was essentially out. She admitted to Alia that she was indeed Portland's own Green Lantern, and that Alia had to take the ring off, that it would inevitably corrupt her. But Alia begged for them to first go out on a flight together. If she did indeed have to give it up, at least let her use the ring once. Jessica was hesitant, but agreed, and the two shot up out of Alia's apartment and started flying around the city, then up into space to observe the world from a view unlike anything Alia had ever experienced. Jessica kept telling Alia more and more about her life as a lantern, and it was all incredibly exciting for Alia. All the while, of course, Jessica asked many times how Alia was feeling, 
if thoughts of greed were starting to overtake her mind. But Alia said, while well, she was feeling strong desires being elevated, they were for more information on the lanterns, and for more time with the ring to use it to help people and solve problems like Jessica got to do with her own. Tentatively, Jessica allowed Alia to keep the ring a bit longer, and she ended up using it to go with Jessica on a rescue mission out on Mars. Jessica then spoke to the Guardians of the Universe themselves about the situation, expecting the often uptight group to say that Alia had to give up the ring immediately. But surprisingly, they too were curious to see what a new wearer of this ring could do. For a long time, Larflees had been the sole wielder, and he himself had been a very greedy being even without the ring. Well, it did amplify strong desires and needs. If it was in the possession of a wielder whose desires were for more information and to be more useful, then perhaps the orange ring could be used for good. And so, Alia was allowed to keep her ring, so long as she continued to work alongside Jessica Cruz. In her own unique lantern attire, Alia would prove to be a hero just as useful to her corner of the galaxy as Jessica, Simon, and any other member of the Green Lantern Corps. The powers of Dr. Fate have been passed on to many different people. Donning the Helmet of Fate, the Amulet of Anubis, and the Cloak of Destiny, a chosen wearer can take on immeasurable mystical powers granted by the Lords of Order. But even with good intentions originally fueling the creation of these items, that does not mean they were always used by a benevolent wielder. Gabriel Agreste was an incredibly wealthy man with a fascination with items of power. Even before the death of his wife, he'd longed for power, but her passing just made him want it more, so that he could find some way to bring her back. He knew there were many incredible items in his world and universe, and he wanted to gather as many of them for himself as he could. But it wasn't exactly easy to find something like a Green Lantern ring or Nth Metal Mace on eBay or Amazon. Gabriel would go out on many trips and spend time searching through all manner of illegal markets and sources to find the items he was after, though he found that since he was so wealthy, many eyes would be on him, eager to report the scandalous actions. To try and maintain appearances as an upstanding member of society, he'd hire others to go out and do his dirty work for him, and further still, he'd even adopt an orphan son named Billy to try and make him seem more charitable still. Though, in truth, he rarely spent much time with the boy, and would often just throw money at any problems Billy brought his way. He did truly care for the boy, but thought that he could spend time with him after he completed his mission and brought back his wife. After years of searching, his sources were finally able to purchase for him on the black market a damaged but still very powerful set of items. A dagger and a tattered cape. You see, the previous wielder of the Helmet of Fate was a troubled man named Jared Stevens, who'd altered the Cloak of Destiny into an armband and melted down the helmet into a dagger. He'd even let the Amulet of Anubis be destroyed. Jared had been killed and his mystical artifacts had been taken by smugglers, eventually enabling Gabriel to purchase them for an obscene amount of money. But at least they were finally his. He reforged the dagger back into a helmet, somewhat like it had appeared previously. He also reformed the cloak, adding it to a suit that he could wear. Often the wielder of these objects would be heavily influenced by the sorcerer Nabu, whose soul was trapped within them. But his connection to the Helmet of Fate had been weakened by how the helm had been altered and re-altered. So all he could really do was give the occasional word of wisdom to Gabriel. Words he often just ignored. You see, the first thing that Gabriel asked Nabu was how he could use the helmet's power to bring his wife back. Nabu said that this was not possible, but Gabriel didn't believe him. Heroes and villains of his world came back to life constantly, so there had to be some power he could gain that could bring his wife back. Nabu still claimed that with just the helmet, this could not be done. This, of course, just elevated Gabriel's yearning for more items of power. Still wanting to remain as anonymous as he could, however, instead of using the powers that he now had to go out into the world himself and steal items from heroes and villains of the world, he'd instead use his immense magical abilities to seek out chaos-filled minds, people in great stress or anger that he could grant powers to temporarily and manipulate them into doing his bidding. Of course, he could never give anybody his full power, so his minions were often defeated, most commonly by his home city's resident hero, Captain Marvel, sometimes also called Shazam. 
He became so frustrated with the hero that he started researching the history of Shazam's abilities to see if there was a way for him to steal these powers as well. All the while having no idea that the person he was trying to steal power from was his own adopted son, Billy Batson. So, as Gabriel would spend much of his waking life trying to find a way to gain more power to bring back his wife, he'd not realize that all the while he was neglecting and even fighting against the only family he now had in this world. If you enjoyed this and you want more like it, I've got tons of similar videos putting Ninjago characters into different superhero universes, turning Marvel heroes into DC villains, turning FNAF animatronics into Marvel superheroes, I'll just link the whole playlist of what I consider to be my best superhero related episodes. And if you want more out of this channel, I've got a brand new art book out, I've got a Patreon where you can get early access to inks and art, plus a bonus podcast series, and I've got a Teespring store with tons of posters and ink bundles and things like that. All that'll be linked in the description, but besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote from Soren Kierkegaard, who said the most common form of despair is not being who you are. You can pretend to be someone else to try and get affection or try and get other people to care about you, but on a deeper level and in the long term, that's only ever going to hurt you. So do your best to be your true self and trust that people who like that version of you are eventually going to come into your life. I hope that's inspiring. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday. Goodbye.